Welcome back. Um, in the last few lectures, we were talking about um, pre-Columbian contact Native American societies uh, that were alive and well before Europeans started showing up after 1492. Today, what I'd like to talk about is the interconnections that will inevitably occur between Europe, the Americas, and Africa in the aftermath of Columbus's uh, quote-unquote discovery of the Americas. Before we go there, however, I, I want to pose a question for you. The question is really simple. Why Europe? Why was it Europe? and Europeans that came to dominate the world in a very sh few short years. Let me point out something. Before the 1400s, um, Europe was engulfed in something called the Middle Ages, medieval times. If you've ever been there, uh, I mean, we're talking about downtown Dallas, um, you know that uh, they, they kind of put on this really crude show. They don't give you silverware because they didn't have silverware back then. The bottom line is the medieval time period in European history is a really dark time period. That's why a lot of historians even call it the Dark Ages. Let me put it to you more succinctly, okay? The medieval time period is the time period after the fall of the Roman Empire. And Rome had been policing the streets of Europe and had been, uh, you know, encouraging commerce and studying things like medicine. And then when Rome fell, Europe descended into what came to be known as a dark period. Uh, learning was kind of put on ice. Uh, medicine was put on ice. And people became more and more interested in just simply day-to-day -day survival. Now, take that and combine it with a couple other extenuating circumstances. First of all, the bubonic plague. Many of you may have heard of that before. This was a disease that we think arrived in Europe uh, via China. Uh, we think what happened was rats aboard Italian ships were carrying fleas, and when the fleas, uh, you know, um, disembarked along with the human beings, um, they infected the European population, and they were the carriers of this bubonic plague, a.k.a. Black Death. The bubonic plague, over the course of the medieval time period, it wiped out over a third of Europe's population. I mean, can you imagine a third of the American population just simply disappearing? Can you imagine the social consequences that that was going to have? So anyway, the bubonic plague is wreaking havoc on Europe, and it makes Europe a very unlikely candidate to come to dominate world, um, uh, world relations. Next, and probably even more significant, it was Africa, and in particular North Africa, that imposed its will on Europe throughout most of the medieval time period, not the other way around. Um, there, there's a lot of famous battles that you can point to, but the one that I point to all, all oftentimes is a guy by the name of Charles Martel, who was a Frenchman, who uh, defeated the Moors at the Battle of Tours. And really what you're talking about is the French finally putting a stop to uh, North African invasions um, in southern France. So you take this and you combine it with the fact that Europe not only was backwards, it was, you know, dark, it didn't have a lot of learning, and it was suffering from uh, this ravaging disease, and, and it would be one of the last places that you would expect to become a leader in terms of world commerce or world power, okay? And then everything changed. Now, those of you that have taken a Western Civilizations course or you've done a little bit of world history, you know that the next time period in European history that comes after the medieval time period, that would be the Renaissance, right? Quick and easy way to remember the Renaissance. I like to think of it as the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You've got your Leonardo, you've got your Michelangelo, you've got your Raphael, and you've got your Donatello, Right? Now, of course, I'm making a joke, but uh, you know, you're know, you talking about very famous European artists. And the word Renaissance in French literally translates into rebirth. Rebirth of what? Well, art, but also things like science, also things like geography, things like math, things like architecture, things that were studied heartily in the day and age of Rome that are rediscovered and consequently reborn in the, let's call it the 1400s, okay? Okay. 
Now, um, one of the things that is happening, uh, really this is happening even earlier than the 1400s, one of the things that's happening that's really encouraging people to study things like maps and geography is an Italian traveler, a guy by the name of Marco Polo. Now, many of you know that name. It's not just a summertime game. The reason that you know that name is that Marco Polo was a world traveler in the 1200s, the late 1200s, that is. He went on vacation, and his destination was China. Now, this is a long, long time before you could get from Italy to China with one hop of a plane. And so you have to understand that he not only walked, he went through other places that were considered exotic to the Europeans. I mean, think about it. He, he's going through the Middle East. And there's all kinds of things that are available in the Middle East. Not only information, but other things that you can't find in any European street corner. Spices and other products like that. So he goes through there, he goes through South Asia, and finally he arrives in East Asia, China. And when he comes back, he brings all these cool things. I mean, he brings things like rice, he brings things like silk. I mean, silk was really important, especially if you've ever been to Europe in the summer, you'll know what I'm talking about. It doesn't get hot like it does in Texas, but it gets hot enough to make that wool sweater that you're wearing pretty uncomfortable. So if you could go down to the local vendor and get yourself some sil silk, that really, that really sets you apart from everybody else. My point is he's bringing back these things that Europeans desperately want to buy, including gunpowder. Gunpowder is probably the most important thing that Marco Polo brings back. Here's the thing. If you wanted these things and you lived in a place like Spain or England or Germany, someplace like that, you had to buy it through the Italians. I mean, they had a lock, they had a monopoly on the trade with the East. So naturally, if, if you're Spain or if you're one of those Western or Northern European countries, you're going to want to find a different way around uh, the Italian trade because you're sick and tired of paying through the nose uh, for these products that you want. Enter into the conversation a guy from Portugal named Prince Henry. Okay. Now what I'd like you to understand about Prince Henry is really two things. First of all, he is really what helps to put Portugal on the map by stopping the invasion of these northern African raiders. So he stabilizes Portugal from a social, military, and political standpoint. And in the aftermath of stabilizing it, he sets up a naval observatory in Algiers, North Africa. Now, this naval observatory, really this is a place where people that know a thing or two about the Mediterranean world can come together and study maps maps that had been forgotten about since the days of ancient Rome. Well, he networks with people like North African traders, sub-Saharan African traders, and little by little, what Prince Henry is able to do is navigate the Portuguese Navy around the coast of South Africa, eventually up the coast of East Africa, where he networks with South Asia, and eventually the Far East. If it sounds familiar, it's because it's exactly the same thing that the Italians are doing. So what, Mar uh, what uh, Prince Henry did was he found an alternative route to um, um, the East. And what this does is it funnels unimaginable amounts of wealth and consequently power back into Portugal. Portugal becomes a very rich and very powerful European nation primarily because it trades with the East. So, in short, what Prince Henry is doing is he's kind of providing a roadmap, a blueprint, if you will. This is how you can become a rich and powerful European country, if you put your mind to it. Find an alternative route to trade with the East. Now, what is oftentimes overlooked when it comes to Portuguese trade is the trade that they also cultivated with other parts of the world, not just the East. And the parts that we're going to be primarily concerned with, that would be Africa. Now, the one thing that I want you to understand is, initially, Portuguese trading with African kingdoms of the sub-Saharan region was beneficial. There were foods, there were livestock that, did not, uh, that were not indigenous to that part of the continent before Europeans showed up. And so initially, trade with the Portuguese was a benefit, it was beneficial. Now, ultimately, it becomes less and less beneficial, really for an important reason. In addition to colonizing various parts of the Eastern world, the Portuguese were colonizing a collection of islands uh, off their western shore in the Atlantic Ocean called the Verde Islands. 
And one of the things that the Portuguese were growing in the Verde Islands was sugar. Now, if you know anything about the production of sugar, you know that it's a very labor-intensive crop, so you're going to need a lot of workers. And I think you can see where I'm going with this. One of the things that the Portuguese noticed about the sub-Saharan African kingdoms was they had slavery, or at least a form of slavery. Now, let me qualify that for a second. I'm not talking about the kind of slavery that Frederick Douglass describes in his autobiography. I'm essentially talking about really the most common form of a slave in African societies would, would, would be what we would call a prisoner of war. In other words, your kingdom was conquered by the kingdom down the road, they imprisoned all of you, and then they made you work as their, their servants. Now, not only is that much, much different than Frederick Douglass's style of slavery, it was finite. In other words, you could break out of African slavery. You could buy your way out. You could earn your way out. If they thought that you would be a good, dutiful citizen, they could grant you your freedom. Not only that, you didn't pass that status as slave on to the next generation. I mean, one of the famous lines in Douglas is, I am a slave and a slave for life. Douglas is a slave because his mother's a slave. And if he had any kids, they would be slaves too. In other words, there's something about your DNA in American style of slavery that sets you apart from the free population and makes you a slave. Not the case with African kingdoms. So we've talked about what the Europeans want with the African kingdoms. They want things like gold, ivory, and later on, slaves to, to work in their sugar islands. It begs the questions, what does the African kingdom want? Well, in short, what they want are those magic sticks where you pull the trigger and your enemy, 50 yards down the way, falls dead. Of course, what I'm talking about is gun technology. They wanted European weapons. So, how do you get more slaves? Because, of course, that's, that's what the Africans know that the Europeans, the Portuguese, want. Well, you get more slaves by conquering other kingdoms. And the best way to conquer them is with guns, all right? So do you see where I'm going here? What the Portuguese are going to do, whether they meant to or not, is touch off a series of vicious civil wars of which African society has still not really recovered. I mean, one of the reasons it was so easy for European uh, nations to go in and carve up interior Africa is because you're talking about approximately three or four hundred years of internal warring amongst those various kingdoms. So in order to dominate the trade, you need to provide the most amount of slaves. And in order to get the slaves, you need to go out and conquer more people. You conquer them with guns, and when you give the slaves to the Europeans, you get more guns. This isn't going to be the last time that we talk about um, civil wars that were prompted by European contact. But for the time being, I need you to understand that ultimately those slaves are going to go further to the west and ultimately make their way to the Americas in something that we'll call the uh, transatlantic system. Okay. Anyway, Portugal's neighbor to the east, um, that would be Spain. And Spain's much bigger, probably has more resources, but it's lagging pitifully behind its neighbor to the west, Portugal. Now, that changes when King Ferdinand uh, married Queen Isabella um, of Spain, and they not only united what you think of as modern-day Spain, if you looked at a map today, they also made a concerted effort to really grow the Spanish economy. Ask yourself, how do you become a rich and powerful European nation during this period? You trade, and in particular, you trade with the East. So what they needed was yet another alternative route to get from Madrid, to get from Spain, over to China. Enter into our conversation a sea captain from Genoa, Italy, by the name of Christopher Columbus. We all know the story. Columbus had this great radical idea of sailing west to get to the east, because he had this radical idea that the world was round. Now let me point something out. Columbus didn't invent the idea that the world was round. The ancient Greeks knew that the world was round. Uh, the Aztecs knew that the world was round. There's a lot of people, educated people, arguably even Ferdinand and Isabella understood that the world was round. They had a much better understanding of things than the medieval time period. The issue was nobody was crazy enough to try to do this. It hadn't been done before, and there was not a lot of takers when it comes to try this radical thing that nobody's ever accomplished. 
Columbus was radical in the sense that he actually attempted to do something like this. So what Ferdinand and Isabella did is they gave him three rickety old ships, they emptied the uh, prisons of Madrid, and they served as his crew members. And they said, yeah, Chris, knock yourself out. You know, I mean, if he gets lost along the way, his whole, his whole crew dies. You know, it really didn't cost us all that much. We've got everything to gain. Well, months later, after his crew was threatening to make him walk the plank, um, they sighted land. Now, of course, Columbus thinks he's off the coast of India. Now, in fact, where he is is the modern-day nation of San Salvador, right? But anyway, being off the coast of India, naturally he named the inhabitants of the island Indians, right? Now, he thought he was in the eastern hemisphere, but as a matter of fact, he had stumbled into a world that was completely unbeknownst to the Europeans, okay? Hence the term, the New World. Now, we can talk a little bit more about Columbus, but what I'd like you to understand about Christopher Columbus, in addition to bumping into the Western Hemisphere, he also began to bring a lot of Spaniards back to the New World with him, okay? And these early Spanish uh, colonies are essentially going to be, um, they're, they're going to be developing wealth that you cannot find in Europe proper, uh, things like tobacco, things like uh, food crops that sold very well in the European marketplace, but didn't grow very well in Europe. And as he's sending these things back, keep in mind, he still firmly believes he's in the East. Ferdinand and Isabella understand he's nowhere near China, he's nowhere near India, but they knew a good thing when they saw it. So they encouraged more and more of these Spanish settlements to go over to the Western Hemisphere. So you've got Ponce de Leon, that was exploring the, uh, the coast of Florida in search for the fabled um, Fountain of Youth. You've got Vasquez Nunez de Balboa, that was uh, the first European to see the Pacific Ocean. As a matter of fact, he was the guy that gave it its name because he felt it was so, such a peaceful ocean. But the individual that I'd like to talk about with the time that we have remaining is a Spanish military official by the name of Hernán Cortés. Right? Now, Cortes uh, was stationed in the modern-day nation of Cuba, and eventually it's going to be Cortes that's going to be commissioned by the Spanish crown to lead an expedition of the mainland. What the Spanish continue to hear day in and day out from these indigenous populations are these famous cities of gold. Of course, what they're talking about is the Aztec Empire, okay? So anyway, it's Cortes that leads this expedition with 500 Spanish conquistadors. They're all on horses, they all have armor, but they're taking on one of the most powerful empires in the history of the world, the Aztec Empire. So how do they pull it off? There's really three things that I need you to be mindful of. First of all, they had important alliances. I mentioned this in the last video. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that, um, that befalls Cortes that works out really well in his favor, is befriending a woman by the name of Malinali, right? Malinali was a Native American woman that spoke not only the Aztec language, she was also fluent in Spanish. So she served as Cortez's guide and his translator. And any time they would come across another Native American tribe, she would be able to convey this message, you should team up with the conquistadors, you should help us to fight the Aztecs. So this is how the Spanish was able to make uh, such important Native American alliances that help them to defeat the Aztecs proper. The second thing that I would be mindful of if I were you would be Spanish military technology. Obviously a gun and certainly a cannon would be much more effective in terms of waging war than something like a spear or a bow and arrow. Now that's not even considering things like the horse. Now a lot of times Native Americans are linked to horsemanship but keep in mind, the horse had gone extinct in the Western Hemisphere, you know, centuries before the Spanish reintroduced it. So they're not only fighting with guns and cannon, they're fighting on horseback, which, you know, if you've never seen an animal like that, that would terrify armies. So anyway, superior European technology is certainly, certainly one explanation as to why Cortes was ultimately successful. Lastly, the silent ally. And of course, what I'd be talking about here that would be disease, okay? Do you remember me talking about how the Native Americans had been cut off for the rest of the known world for 3,000 years? Well, that also meant that they had developed, biologically, they had developed much differently for 3,000 years. 
I used to teach at Michigan State, and um, you know, Michigan State's a lot different than a lot of other colleges in that area, in the sense that it's got a world-renowned agricultural department. And so, at Michigan State, we would get a lot of kids from the boonies. They would be from Nowhereville, Michigan, or uh, the middle of nowhere, Indiana, places like that. They would come there to study agriculture. Well, they hadn't been around those metropolitan populations of Detroit or Cleveland, Indianapolis, um, you know, Chicago. And so when they would get there, they would all get sick. They hadn't developed the antibodies, the immune system, to help them fight off things that people from, let's say, uh, metropolitan Chicago would consider to be maybe a, a, minor, a minor nuisance, as in the common cold. Think about this in terms of smallpox, right? Smallpox was not known in the Native American world. And when the Spanish, um, not knowingly, introduced it into the Native population, it wreaked as much and arguably more havoc on the Native American population than the bubonic plague did in the Middle Ages in European society. It, in some instances, you see a population drain. The population goes down upwards of 90%. So this issue of disease, smallpox, measles, mumps, chickenpox, things that we consider to be almost like a dead disease in this day and age, they devastated Native American populations and how to explain how and why Cortez was ultimately successful when it comes to conquering the Aztec Empire. Now, there's another term that I want to introduce to you when it comes to the results of the Spanish... Um, uh, the Spanish contact with the Americas, the Colombian exchange, okay? There are things that were not indigenous to Europe, or excuse me, to the Americas that the Europeans were introducing, right? I've already mentioned the horse, and we can imagine how that revolutionizes Native American society. The cow was not indigenous. The um, pig was not indigenous. All these livestock that come over and really thrive in the Americas. I mean, think about Brazil without cattle. Think about Texas without cattle, right? Um, foodstuffs, uh, or food crops, rather, that are introduced into the, um, into the Americas. But at the same time that you've got European things coming over to the Americas, you've got an even more important exchange from the Americas going over to the New World, or excuse me, the Old World. Um, first of all, the potato. I mean, if you've ever ate an Irish pub, you know that a potato is a staple of the Irish diet. Really, you could make the case for any northern European country, Scandinavian, German, British, whatever you want to call it. Potatoes are a really important staple because they have so many calories. They didn't grow in Europe. It was the exchange with the Americas that introduced the potato to the Europeans. Same thing with the pumpkin, same thing with the tomato. Same thing, especially with corn. Maize is an incredibly nutritious food crop that fuels a population boom in the Old World. Not just Europe, but all across uh, the Eastern Hemisphere, you see a population growth primarily because you've got more food to feed more people. More babies are not only being born, you now have healthier mothers that are nursing them, so more babies are surviving into adulthood. At the same time that the American population, the Native American population that is, is going down, it's declining, the European population is increasing. Now that's going to have significant consequences when it comes to colonization, but we'll save that lecture for another time. What I want to do now is talk about the decline of Spain. Now by the time that, um, uh, the time that other European countries begin to cash in on this whole idea of contact with the New World, Spain is going into decline primarily because of leadership. Um, the, the king of Spain at this particular moment is a guy by the name of Philip. And Philip was a devout Catholic. And it really annoyed him, this Reformation, uh, the introduction of what is now called Protestantism in parts of Europe. And so what Philip does is get Spain involved in a lot of really ill-advised wars. And one of the things that it does is it gets involved with the war with England. Now, you can say what you want about the English army, you know, mediocre or whatever, especially when you compare it to Spain, which was not only the most powerful, but also the richest. But one thing that the English have always been good at is their navy. They've always had a top-notch navy. Now, 
at this particular moment, England is led by uh, Queen Elizabeth I, and she is the daughter of Henry VIII. Not to make this a European history class, but uh, just to give you a little bit of context. And Elizabeth is a brilliant European monarch for a number of different reasons, but one of the things that she's doing is she's commissioning people like Captain Morgan um, to go out there and raid uh, Spanish gold ships. She's actually telling pirates to go out there and seize these gold ships, bring them back to England. Well, Philip knew what was going on, and he had had enough of this, so uh, eventually he declared war on England, and he said that uh, he was going to invade. England's an island nation, which should give you a little bit of an idea as to why it's got such a powerful navy. It has to have a powerful navy to survive. So anyway, this was a very ill-advised war in the sense that, you know, you're taking on the number one navy in the world, and you have to have a successful amphibious invasion to do it. You've got to, you, you, you've got to essentially invade. And if you know anything about English history, you know that the last guy to successfully pull this off was a guy named William the Conqueror, right? So it's not been done for the better part of 500 years. Philip doesn't listen, and it could not go worse. The Spanish Armada, as it came to be known, was a disaster for Spain, and this is when you really begin to see Spain decline and England take off when it comes to world powers. The English not only decimated the Spanish Navy, as luck would have it, there was a storm that blew the Spanish Navy all across the North Sea and just decimated what, what, what ships and units were not completely destroyed by the English Navy. Okay? Now, the other reason that, um, that, that Queen Elizabeth I is such an important um, European monarch is that she begins to follow the Spanish model when it comes to colonization. Now, for your notes, what colonization is, is establishing little base ports over in some other distant part of the world. So, for instance, um, New Spain, as it would come to be known, what you're talking about primarily is Mexico, that was a Spanish colony. England begins to do this in the late 1500s, especially off its eastern coast, or excuse me, western coast, uh, that would be the island nation of Ireland, okay? the English begin to colonize Ireland, and what they do is the same thing that the Spanish are doing in Mexico, modern-day Mexico, they're extracting the wealth, right? They're taking what is lucrative, what is valuable, out of Ireland, and they're funneling it back into England. This whets the English appetite, and later on, in the early 1600s, what you're going to see are permanent American establishments, colonies, that is, that are established by the English, and would later become permanent. Um, that's as far as I want to go today. I'm hopeful that what I've done now is given you some context in terms of why the relationships of, uh, of, of Europe, uh, Africa, and later on the Americas are becoming so intertwined. In the next segment, we're going to be talking about various modes or models of European colonization. And what you're going to find is the Spanish have a very different approach to the French model when it comes to colonization. And the French model is quite different than the Dutch model, and the Dutch model is very different from the English model. You'll understand a lot more what I'm talking about in our next segment.